and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Hello, everyone. And if you're in the United States, I'm saying top of the morning and happy Thanksgiving to everyone. This is Martin Willis, the host of Podcast UFO. And the reason I'm saying top of the morning is because our show was not live last night. We had a major snowstorm here in Maine all yesterday and last night, and my power went out just before the broadcast. I tried to hook up my generator, but the modem wouldn't work. So this is a pre-recorded show, and our guest, Lee Spiegel, was gracious enough to agree to record with me on this holiday to get a show out to you this week, albeit late. We have a lot of fun things to talk about with Lee today, including a strange Rolling Stones interview he just did about aliens and UFOs. I had pre-recorded the news with Alejandro Rojas, so that'll be coming up in just a few minutes. And we usually come at you live every week on Wednesday night at 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Dark Matter Radio Network. A little housekeeping here. You can always listen to the whole show for free on the Dark Matter Radio Network. That is when my power doesn't go out. And starting next week, the second hour of the podcast will be hosted on a program that will launch on December 1st. Subscribers will be able to download and listen to the second half of the shows on all kinds of platforms, including iTunes and more. And if you've not been able to subscribe with PayPal, this same platform will also be able to accept a vast variety of payment options. We'll give you all the details about this in next week's show. Ever since I added an hour to the show, making the second hour of the podcast paid subscription only, people have been upset that I'm cutting the interview in half for the non-paying listeners, and I totally get this. And though I can't possibly make everyone happy, I had two choices. One, get a second guest, and just getting one guest is a lot of work and a lot of trouble sometimes. Or two, make the monthly subscription so small that it will be affordable to anyone who wants it. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm lowering the monthly subscription to just 99 cents a month. And you'll have an option to pay more, but 99 cents a month will sure get you in. And as a side note, if you are a subscriber at 99 cents or more a month and you listen to YouTube only, please let me know. I may be able to do something with that in the future. You know, I've been getting a lot of feedback, and some of it good, of uh, people trying to help me out. And as a matter of fact, when I dropped the rate down to $0.99, cents, um, one of the subscribers that were on at $5 canceled his subscription, and he re-signed for double that amount. Thank you, Gary. Again, there's been a lot of great support, and it's really appreciated. A lot of people upset, too. So hopefully this will work out. Everyone will be happy, or close to everyone will be happy. And... That's it for now, and we're coming back with Alejandro with the news right after this quick little music clip. What's going on, Alejandro? Hello! UFOs are going on, buddy, and just in time for Turkey Day, uh, whether there is a correlation between UFO sightings and uh, turkeys during this site, part yeah. of the holiday season, uh, that has not been confirmed. Just uh, yeah. to clear that out. Yeah, I think I've, I think I've heard something about that. Yeah, Turkey, yeah. Turkey Day sightings. Know. Hey, I got to tell you quickly before we get rolling here, so I'm having an alien problem. No. Uh-oh. Well, it's not really... They're alien to where they are, and it kind of reminds me of Chevy Chase in uh, Christmas Vacation. But, you know, my house where I live, right next door to me is was a convention center. I'm going to turn it into something else. I'm not really sure what I'm doing with it, but I sealed the squirrels. Out. They were in there last winter, mm-hmm. and I got them all out this spring, and they sealed the whole place up. Well, they're in there again. I went into a room the other day, and one was running around in the room, climbs up the curtain, I'm trying to get a door open. I'm going everywhere. The doors are all frozen shut. I'm trying to get them open. The squirrel's up on the curtain rod. 
It jumps, bounces off my chest. I scream like an idiot, jump you in the other room. Kidding. Nope. And, uh, but anyway, I, I think I got him out. Oh gosh. Yeah, because I let him out. Wow. They come back in. So it's a gray squirrel alien gray problem. Gray even. Oh, yeah. my gosh. It was probably sent by the aliens. That is not normal I know. behavior. So that's a bit of an anomaly. And we all know Giorgio has taught us that all anomalies are alien related. That's right. And if you look at their eyes, yes. They do. <laughs> I love squirrels. They're cute little buggers. But, uh, yeah, that would be a, a bit unnerving. And I don't over. know that I want to live with them. Yeah, they are. Through they take over them. fast, let me tell you. Wow, that's amazing. Well, yeah. I hope you solve that alien problem. Uh, <laughs> I, I so. don't know a specialist in this sort of alien problem. If uh, he had been extraterrestrial, I would have been able to refer you to someone. Yeah, well, I am looking to abduct them and set them free somewhere else. I, I have a have a heart trap. That's hard to say. Yeah, I have. I have a heart trap. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what's going on with the news this week? So what's going on? Bassett goes to Washington again. Steve, so we've written ever since I've been in this field. I write this story over and over and over and over and over again. Each time, uh, you know, Bassett feels disclosures right around the corner. Sometimes he he puts a date and says it, it's within a month, it's within within a week, and uh, unfortunately, none of that has ever happened. Of course, the most exciting Bassett goes to Washington story was a year ago, right, or so, mm-hmm. and that was for the citizens' hearing, which uh, of course I'm sure your listeners are familiar with where he took lots of very credible people to speak with some former uh, members of congress about ufos in a mock kind of congressional hearing well this is phase two of that and uh, phase two entails him he he made a 10 disc dvd set of the entire video uh testimony and he sent that to 538 uh, members of congress and now he is asking people to kind of go on social media and to ping via twitter or facebook all of these uh members of congress and say hey check out those videos he is hoping this will then create congressional hearings, which he says then will topple the truth embargo. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, he, he was hoping, he said, to get a lot of media attention uh, for his campaign here. But uh, thus far, he, he's gotten a story in the Washington Times, uh, not the Post, but a, a different paper. And uh, it's a kind of a short blurb. Um, they don't say a whole lot, but uh, not a lot of media otherwise. He sent everything out on November 5th, so we'll see what happens. I mean, I think, uh, I don't know that any, even an aide is going to sit through, you know, hours and hours of video. So uh, maybe something more concise would have been good, uh, like an executive briefing kind of thing to give them. But he's done that in the past, so uh, we'll see if it goes anywhere. Yeah, you know, Steve was the first guest on this show, so uh, you know, I'm, I'm always going to be nice to him. He, he helped me out because it's it's hard when you're starting a show and to get the very first guest on, mm-hmm. uh, and he takes this stuff darn serious. Oh yeah, and and, and he gets angry about it. You know, yeah. he's he's passionate about it. So mm-hmm. you got to love anyone passionate about anything. I think, don't you? Sort of. Um, sometimes, certainly, we've ran into those people who uh, take their passion a little uh, to the extremes, mm-hmm. and uh, that can be bad. That can be. <laughs> so, what else is happening? Tis the season for crowdfunding. There are three crowdfunding projects that we wrote about in the past uh, week regarding UFOs or at least uh, kind of space related, uh, all of which are pretty exciting. And so, uh, however, I don't know that this is a time that people are taking out their checkbook to crowdfund. Really, they're taking out their checkbook to buy sweaters and ties and various other gifts for people, mostly of which are, are not appreciated by the receiver. 
So the first campaign is uh, one that I've written about, and oh, I'm going to bash Huffington Post, uh, which Lee Spiegel's a part of. He's actually been helping. I've written a bunch of blogs lately for the Huffington Post, one on Travis Walton recently, but they actually denied one of my blogs, and this is about this space warp project, because I've interviewed, I, I think you might have to, yes. this gentleman named David Paris, yes. uh, who's an adjunct professor he, uh, out of the University of uh, Nebraska and other schools out there. Him, along with some grad students and some engineers, have put together what they believe is a space warp technology. Now they are uh, having an Indiegogo campaign to crowdfund this technology in order to build a working model, a drone that will fly around. I think this is extremely exciting. And so I wrote about it on our site, but I, I posted a blog for Huffington Post, and for some reason they denied me, which is so frustrating for me because I was hoping to get their project in a bigger venue, get more eyes on it, because I think they deserve a shot. You know, they're not asking for a whole lot of money, but uh, I, I would love to see them possibly build something to ferret this out, to discover whether this technology that they have uh, believe they've been able to demonstrate works or not. Yeah, that is surprising. Yeah, so, you know, give Lee some some stuff for me. Give him a hard time. I will. I'll try. Yeah. Although, admittedly, he is helping me, and hopefully he will get that posted. But oh, their Kickstarter campaign is not, or I'm sorry, it's Indiegogo, is not lasting very much longer. It's only going for a few more days. So I urge people to go up there and to give him some money. I think this is a really cool project. And the second, of course, is the MUFON website, which we talked about last week. So they've still got that rolling about a week left. Uh, they've actually gotten now close to $20,000. I guess people have mailed in. They've got close to 30000 if you include those. But through the Kickstarter, they've got about something like 15000 now. So they're, they've got a week to go to make their 78000 uh, However, the third is one that I'm really excited about as well, which is uh, Robert Hastings is doing a... Uh, documentary. Of course, he's spoken with over 115 witnesses to uh, military witnesses, to people who say they've worked at nuclear facilities and they have seen UFOs and, and or those UFOs have reacted with the nuclear weapons. So I think he's got some incredible information and research. Some people have argued, well, we've seen this on TV. But Robert Hastings doesn't do TV. He's frustrated with TV producers because he says they just take your research and they screw it up and I agree with them because usually they, they do add dubious material. It's very frustrating that the producers aren't more careful with your research. So he's uh, usually denies when he gets requests to work with TV production uh, companies. So to see his pure data and research, which is amazing, uh, he's trying to work on a documentary. He said he was given $100,000. He's gone through that. He just needs 25000 more to finish this up. So he's asking people for donations. So hopefully people will do that because uh, you can even watch a five-minute clip there, and it's chock full of these amazing sightings and cases as told by these military witnesses so everybody's uh, vying for your money um, maybe give a little bit to each I don't know what to advise you there but uh, you know check in five bucks or something people right Okay, yeah, the last story is just kind of related to the UFO nukes. It's just in Alabama recently there was a sighting over a nuclear power plant. So that's just kind of interesting just to show that uh, these sightings over uh, nuclear sites still happen. And that is the news from OpenMinds.tv. Thanks so much, and you can find links to this right in our show notes. It'll go right to the story. Thanks so much, Alejandro, and My we'll be pleasure. talking to you next week. All right, talk to you soon. Have, Have a great a Thanksgiving. Turkey Day. Same to you. Good Thanksgiving. All right, we're coming right back with Lee Spiegel from the Huffington Post and music by Carrie Lloyd Whitehouse. Hang in for right after the clip.
Lee, hey, thanks for joining us on this special American holiday, Thanksgiving. How are you? Well, I'm fine, and, and a happy Turkey Day to you, too. Thank you. And, yeah, what a nightmare last night was. And I'm sorry we didn't get to record. You and I were talking every few minutes, and it just wasn't happening. I know, and I felt badly also for... I had a, I had actually uh, mentioned to a few friends of mine that the, they, they might want to catch the show live, and, uh, and I told them how to find it on, on the, the Internet, and they, they probably didn't hear us. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. not. Now, they were hearing reruns and kept waiting for you. Yeah. yeah. Hey, um, so last time you were on, we ended the show, um, and you said that you were going to talk next time on how you brought UFOs to the United Nations. And let's, uh, I know that was a long time ago, and that's really interesting. Let's hear about that. Well, you know, it, it was a long time ago. Uh, it seems like a lifetime ago. And uh, it's probably the, the thing that I'm most proud of uh, in my career working and researching UFOs. Um, a lot of people consider it, still consider it, a milestone in the whole effort of trying to get some kind of international disclosure uh, about the UFO field. Um, back in 1977, I was I was noticing that the Prime Minister of Grenada, um, Eric Gary, he had his own little crusade going on to try and get the United Nations to pay attention to him. To, to his, he was he was really pleading with the nations of the world to put some kind of a committee together to share and study UFOs. But I also noticed in the press that. Nobody was really taking him very seriously, so I thought, well, boy, this is this is, would be a great opportunity um, if the United Nations would kind of step in to to do this. So I just kind of came up with an idea um, of of trying to meet the man and and propose to do a pitch to him about maybe letting me help. And so what I did was, um, as you and I had discussed the last time I was on. I, I sent my 1975 UFO documentary record album called UFOs, The Credibility Factor. I sent a couple of copies of it over to the Grenada Mission at the United Nations. And uh, I said to his ambassadors, please give my album to your prime minister with my compliments and tell him that I'd love to meet him and discuss some ways that I could help him in his crusade to bring United Nations and UFOs together in some way. And so they, they, uh, they, they got the album down to him, down to Grenada, and I was invited to the United Nations on the night that Eric Gary was knighted and became Sir Eric Gary. Hmm. And it was, it was great. It was, it was like the first time I'd ever, the only time actually that I'd ever been to the United Nations with some pomp and circumstance ceremony and I got to see different leaders of, of the United Nations. Uh, I mean, I, they certainly do this on a regular basis, but that was not part of my life at the time. And at some point, during the evening, I was introduced to Sir Eric Gary, and we went into a, a room alone where we could just talk for a few minutes. And, and I, I said, with all due respect, sir, I've been following your, your crusade in the media to try and get the United Nations to take you seriously about UFOs, but they're not taking you seriously. I can help you do that. Are you interested? And over a handshake, he said, yes, I would be very much interested in having you do this. So uh, that's what we decided to do. And and he offered uh, to to fund uh, my my part of the presentation in case I needed to do any traveling to collect speakers, documents, information, and and I discovered at the time very quickly that it, you you cannot just walk into the United Nations and say ah I'd like to do a presentation here. They they just won't allow you to do that unless you are a member of a delegation or of a country that is interested in putting something together. And I wasn't a member, so they had to uh, they had to make me a delegate. And I and I actually got. 
a delegate card uh, hmm. that indicated that I was a delegate of, of Grenada. And in fact, uh, for any listeners who are really interested in seeing more about this, if if they go to my website, which is simply leespiegel.com, and click on the button that says UN, you, you will see my, my official 1978 Grenada delegation card <laughs> uh, and, and other interesting pictures from that whole situation. So I started off working on, on the presentation and uh, preparing all the materials that we were going to, to need and, and getting people lined up to become part of this, like astronomer J. Allen Hynek, uh, nuclear physicist Stanton Friedman, Astronaut Gordon Cooper, uh, astronomer Jacques Vallée, um, French astronomer Claude Poher, who had just created the the official French uh, UFO study group called uh, Japan, and Japan is still in ex- in existence, and and, so, and other people, um, Army uh, Major Larry Coyne, who was the um, the commander of a four man helicopter who in 1973 was involved with a near collision with the the UFO over Ohio. I mean, I got all these people. These were people who had primarily been on my UFO album, so it was easy for me to get them to to come together and and be with me at the United Nations because they already knew that that I was serious about this, Mm. and, and they all wanted to be at the U.N., so once I got them all to agree, uh, then in July of, uh, of 1978, there was a preliminary uh, closed-door meeting at the United Nations um, where the Secretary General, Kurt of all time, wanted to meet with me and all of the people that I was going to be bringing to the UN later that year. He, w- he basically wanted to know, well, wh- what are you folks going to do here in November? What's, what's this all about? And, and again, if you listen, go to leespiegel.com and look at UN, you will see uh, a, a, a kind of a famous picture of all of us sitting around the table with the Secretary General at our meeting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I spent the rest of that year just compiling information, getting documents and pictures and films and a variety of things to, to put together for the presentation, which was scheduled uh, near the end of November when the, the General Assembly came back together and they they scheduled us to be uh, in a very big room called the Special Political Committee Room uh, for all the nations. And uh, I, uh, Gordon Cooper, who could not be there in November, uh, said to me, you know, look, I want to be part of this, but I have other obligations. Uh, what, what else can I do? How can I help you with what you're doing uh, in New York? And I, I said, well, you know what, Gordon, here's what you can do. Send me a letter on your official stationery. At the time, he was a vice president for WED Enterprises, WED stands for Walter E. Disney. Um, he worked for a Disney company in California. And I said, send me a letter on your letterhead stationery, basically outlining your personal views on UFOs, where they might come from, why astronauts don't like talking about it publicly, what the United Nations should do about it, etc., etc. And I said, but don't address it to me. Address it to one of the ambassadors or the prime minister of Grenada and their address at the mission of Grenada, but send me the original letter. I will, and, and before I give the original to Grenada, I will make a gazillion copies of it <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so that we can, uh, I mean, because part of what we had to do, Martin, was because of, of the different languages that are used at the UN, all the written materials that I had gathered during the year had to be translated wow. into, into the various languages, the, the, the main three or four languages that are used there. And so I needed time to, to make sure that I handed in all my materials by a specific date so it could then be worked out so all the different languages could be covered. So it was it was it was an interesting task, but I was I was so highly energized every day of, of the year to do this. It was great. Now Lee, let me just interrupt you for sure. Did you were you also working a full-time job while you were trying to do this? I was. I was oh. and and well, since you asked, <laughs> uh, I, I was working at the UN to do this 
during the day, and by night, I was a maitre d' at a restaurant in New York City. Ah. Uh, it was just something I, need, I needed to bring in some extra money to, to pay the rent and other things because uh, because Grenada was only giving me enough money to to handle my expenses hmm. uh, for what I was doing. They weren't giving me a living expense fund. Mm-hmm. And so I was I was okay with that um, because the like I, I don't if I recall I don't think the money that they gave me I don't know if I even had to declare it <laughs> because I got I got it from another country yeah yeah, yeah so I, can't, I really can't remember that and now see now that I'm telling you this on the air now the IRS is gonna <laughs> gonna come get me it's already flagged yeah <laughs> so. Um, and, 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 you know, even when I was working on this project, uh, many times I, I knew, I just knew that I was being watched really? and, and, and my phone was being bugged. Yeah. Wow. It, it's like I'd be on the phone uh, talking to anybody, whether it was somebody about this presentation or just friends or family, and and it, 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 there would be pauses in the conversation, and I could hear breathing, oh, and, and I knew it, was, it, it wasn't my breathing, and it wasn't the breathing of the person I was talking to, um, and and so a couple of times I just I just said you know screw this you know what I'm just going to go for it, and I'd say something like, hey listen guys. I know you're listening, and it's okay. You're not going to get anything from me that's going to be worth anything to anybody. <laughs> so you, you can either continue listening and recording, or just take a break. You know, g- give it up, and you know, thanks for your interest. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would do that just just to acknowledge that 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 I I knew what was going on. Hmm. And and th- this was kind of confirmed to me <clears throat> uh, a couple of months after the whole presentation took place at the end of the year. I got a call from uh, attorney Peter Gersten, who was was very important at the time in helping to to get um, original classified documents released from the government by using the Freedom of Information Act. And and he was he was really responsible for getting a lot of these documents out. And one day he called me. His office was up in the Bronx near Yankee Stadium. And he said, "Listen, I just got a new batch of documents. And one of them is about you. Hmm. And and what you did at the UN, would you would you like me to send you the document?" And I said, "No. I'm coming to your office right now." Yeah. Don't do anything. I want you to hand it to me. Uh, I don't want it to get lost in the mail or anything like that. And I, up up to the Bronx, I went. I got this this two page document, um, in which it was uh, it was written by in, in 1978. It had been written by the uh, American ambassador um, to the United Nations, and it was written to the Secretary of State in Washington. And it and it basically said uh, that the subject of of the document was Grenada UFO Crusade Deja Vu. <laughs> and, Deja Vu. And, yeah, as in here we go again. Unreal. Okay. Wow. And and it talked about, you know, here's what Grenada is is working on this year at the UN. Here's what they're planning on doing at the end of the year, and and it says, you know, un, undaunted by a lack of response to this UFO item since the 32nd General Assembly, Prime Minister Gary has apparently laid the groundwork for a blitzkrieg sales pitch, which will include a cast of supporters ranging from scientists to astronauts, supplemented by a film production. I mean, right now, I'm actually reading from the, the document. The document goes on to say, we understand that the person responsible for bringing the group together is producer Lee Spiegel, who's produced an audiovisual presentation that will follow the testimony of the experts. All of the people listed uh, have been officially accredited to the UN General Assembly by Grenada. So it, it then finishes, the document finishes by saying, here's what they're planning on doing in November. Uh, only a few countries have gone on record with any position on UFOs. Uh, basically, the, the ambassador is asking his bosses at the State Department, what do you want us to do about this? Um, you know, 
how do you want us to, to take any kind of position on this one way or the other? Um, and so I had this document in my hands, which basically said to me, yes, they were paying attention to what I was doing. Wow. Um, that is and, amazing. And, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you again, and you listeners, if, if you want to see the document, you can even copy it if you want. It's on the UN page of my website, at least Spiegel.com. All, I put all the stuff there so everybody can see exactly what this was all about. Wow. Uh, and, and so <clears throat> we, uh, we, we did the presentation. Uh, in November, and uh, my, my three main speakers were Alan Hynek, Jacques Vallée, um, Larry Coyne, the uh, Army uh, helicopter pilot, and, and then uh, following um, a lunch break press conference for the afternoon session, um, Stan Friedman came out and and did his blitzkrieg thing about how yes earth is being visited by some extraterrestrials so the upshot was that all we were trying to do was to get enough official in our interest at the united nations so that some kind of committee could be formed uh, to investigate and to share UFO information from around the world, because the the one of the problems of doing something like this on this kind of a scale is the the language situation. You get different countries with different languages, and they have their own uh, reports. Uh, how do you how do you get this stuff to share it and and to translate the languages? It's a huge it's a huge task. Mm. And and so we were just trying to get a small committee formed that wouldn't cost the United Nations a lot of money. And I, I didn't even want to necessarily or need to be part of the committee. It was once the committee was set up, it could just run by itself. And in the end, the uh, the then Soviet Union and the United States vetoed the resolution, and that pretty much killed it. You know, because none of the other, none of the other countries wanted to wanted to go along with it. And now here's here's kind of a you know fast forward. Like 30 years later, uh, I discovered, um, this is just a couple of years ago, uh, I'm working for Huffington Post and writing a, a lot of stories. Uh, there was a point in time when the United Kingdom was releasing to the public, they were doing uh, these occasional releases of all of the British Ministry of Defense UFO files that they had they had gathered for for decades, and and in batches they were releasing these files to the public, and and so during one of these release points, my editor came up to me and said, um, "Looks like Great Britain is releasing some more UFO files. Do you want to do a piece about it?" And I said, "Sure," because they usually have some good stuff in there, and uh, I could do a couple of interviews and you know make it a good story. So I started going through the uh, the files that they had released. And and I, I I read a story from the BBC. The BBC had gotten the first batch of um, declassified files, and they released them. So I was looking at the BBC story, and and it said um, among the more interesting files released today by the BBC are some that show that in 1978, Great Britain tried to stop a UN presentation from happening. Really. And I went. I'm sorry. What? <laughs> let me let me let me read that over again and make sure I read that correctly. Yeah, in 1978, the the UN was putting a presentation together, or someone was, and that uh, Great Britain didn't think that was a good idea. I went. No, wait a minute. This can't this can't possibly be my presentation. <laughs> but yes, it was. Wow. And and so I I dug out more of the documents that had just been released a couple of years ago about this, <clears throat> and sure enough, all this stuff about how Grenada is doing this and doing that, and and we here in Parliament don't think this is a good idea because uh, it would it would not leave the United Nations with a good reputation if all of a sudden it was it was doing something about UFOs. And I thought, well, wait a minute. The United Nations has its own problems anyway. Um, you know, mm -hmm. 
talking about UFOs isn't just going to add to the problems. I went to my editor and I said, listen, um, this has now become like a personal issue for me. I would like to write the story, but I would like to write it in the first person. Mm. And, basically, and basically say, I've uncovered these documents um, that Great Britain tried to stop my presentation, and now I'm just finding out about this like three decades later? Are you kidding? This is a story. And one of the things that I did was to call up and interview my friend Nick Pope, um, who for a few years, I mean, in the 1990s, he ran the UFO office at the Ministry of Defense. It, he was in charge of looking at all the UFO information that, that came through the office. So when I got him on the phone, first thing he said to me was, I know why you're calling. Uh, <laughs> really? Why, why is that? He said, he said, well, maybe because we just released some information about your presentation in 1978. And I said, yeah, Nick, um, what can you tell me about this? And he said, well, first of all, I had nothing to do with this. <laughs> you, you, you can't blame me because when when you were doing your presentation, I was only a teenager. <laughs> so I wasn't even working at the Ministry of Defense yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, all right, all right, you're off the hook. <laughs> uh, but but why, why would the great United Kingdom not want this to come out? He said, because they thought that the UN would be embarrassed or it would be shamed or, or that it would just place the whole United Nations organization in disrepute or ill repute. And I said, really? You, you're kidding me. He said, for, for better or worse, that's what happened. And, and he said, I, I just, I will go on record right now. I, I will give you an unofficial apology on behalf of my country because since I had nothing to do with it, uh, I can only apologize for me to you. And I said, you know what? I accept your apology. Uh, 30 years late, but yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I obviously, Martin, I, I must have, I must have hit a nerve there somewhere in 1978 yeah. um, to, to get the the, um, the United States ambassador and the State Department interested in what I was doing, to get Great Britain wanting to shut the whole thing down even before we, we put the presentation together. It, it was really interesting to watch this all take place. The upshot was that we did the presentation in November of 1978. A couple of months later, uh, Sir Eric Gary was overthrown in a political takeover in Grenada. So he was suddenly out of power. And just a couple, a few years after that, I'm sitting at home watching the nightly news. And there's this big news item. And this is under President Ronald Reagan. All of a sudden, the news item is the United States has just invaded Grenada. Right. Do, do you remember that? I sure do. <clears throat> Man, I was sitting there watching this, and the only thought that came to my mind was, oh, my God, this is my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> Did you really think that? Oh yeah. I'm f I'm, listen, man, I was following the timeline of all this stuff. Here, here's Eric Gary in 1977 talking it up, talking UFOs up to the United Nations, trying to stir up the pot. Then in 1978, I make a deal with him to do a big presentation about UFOs with some big time speakers and personalities, incredible people. Um, and now I'm stirring the pot. And then, as we now know, Great Britain is, is trying to stop this from happening in 1978, and I didn't know that at the time. And then we do our presentation. It, it goes over really well, and, and suddenly both the United States and the Soviet Union, and maybe they, were, maybe they, they vetoed this together. I don't know. But th so the, the resolution died. It's still available if, if somebody wants to pick it up and run with it again. Mm -hmm. and, then, and, then, and then all of a sudden, Eric Gary is overthrown in a political coup. And, and then we invade Grenada. So when I put all these little elements of the timeline together, I'm, I'm sitting here going, holy crap, <laughs> it had to be my fault. <laughs> I, I mean, I could, I could never prove that. 
But gee whiz, I mean, really. <laughs> yeah, the timing, something else. I mean, I, I didn't want to ever leave my apartment again. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the people you mentioned, you know, all those people you mentioned are, yeah. are iconic. But um, one of them I want to talk about is um, uh, Gordon Cooper. He was one solid guy, if you ask me. You know, I mean, he was just uh, such a, a cautious man. And everything he did, and anyone that becomes an astronaut, first of all, has to be, you know, grade A. And um, I always enjoyed hearing the accounts of his two situations, not actually two, but talking about World War II um, and the fighter jets and seeing basically the Foo mm-hmm. Fighters or whatever they called them. And yeah. then um, when he was involved in that uh, UFO landing when he was yep. filming that day. That's right. What was he like in person? He was he was a great guy. Uh, we we became friends, and and, and I'll tell you, I, while I was working on the the presentation, as I told you, I was a maitre d at at an uh, Upper East Side New York restaurant. When Gordon was coming into New York to do things, he would call he would call me ahead of time, and and say, oh, I'm coming in on a Friday. Can you give me a good table at the restaurant? <laughs> and 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 if there are any uh, young ladies around that you'd like me to meet, <laughs> uh, I, I I'd certainly enjoy meeting some people and telling them all about my exploits. <laughs> uh, he he was a great guy, and uh, in fact. Um, even before I did the uh, the UN presentation, I first met Gordon in 1975 uh, when he was one of the astronauts that I had on my UFO documentary album, and and on one of my trips to California to interview him, I interviewed him several times uh, that year in '75. He had me meet him. Uh, over at the, over the Disney where he worked, uh, because we were going to go and play tennis that day. Oh. And, and I was, I was totally up for that. Uh, I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to play tennis with Gordon Cooper. This is very cool. Uh, so mm-hmm. we, we met, we went to a tennis court and, and he brought out a couple of cans of, of Wilson tennis balls. They were unopened and he, he cracked open the, the can. And these balls came out, and and every one of the balls had the image of Mickey Mouse on them. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, that, that's pretty cool because you can't really buy. I don't think you could buy these particular tennis balls in in a sporting goods store. But wow, we're playing with Mickey Mouse balls. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's that's the kind of guy he was. Um, we used to talk about a lot of interesting things. In, in, in 1980, I believe it was, I did an interview with him for the old Omni magazine. Do you recall oh, yeah. Omni? Mm-hmm. Omni Omni was a magazine that was, was considered it was a great magazine. It was a, it was it was oriented for consumers. It was a very consumer friendly magazine, and. I was one of their featured writers, and I asked them if they'd be interested in having me put together for their interview of the month, an interview with Gordon Cooper, and they said, yeah, absolutely. So we we sat down and we talked about a variety of things um, from his days as an astronaut, from uh, from that, and, and what we did at the United Nations, and, you know, I can't remember specifically how the topic came around to this. But at some point during the interview, we started talking about time travel. Hmm. Uh, I had um, I'd always been interested in this. I think most people are. It's it's one of those things that you grow up and you see you see movies, you read books, and you hear about time travel. It's it's something that we're all kind of fascinated with. Mm-hmm. And we we were just talking about it, and and he just kind of blurted out something to the effect, um, you, you know, I'm I'm working with some astronauts, not astronauts, I'm working with some scientists. I have some scientist friends out here who are in the process now of trying to put a time machine together. I went, really? And this was, ni- this is again, this was 1980, okay? So really, a time machine? And how how exactly would this work? He said, well, the, they're working on a, on a theory of something called orthogonal rotation. And, and for some reason, Martin, I never forgot that phrase. And I, I'm still not sure what it means, but, but this is what he said. And, and all of this went into the final uh, interview uh, that I did with him. He said, yeah, they're working on something called orthogonal rotation where 
the vehicle or the chair or the, the whatever it is that you, you'd be sitting in, it, it rotates in such a way at such a frequency that that they believe that it can break the bounds of of time and traveling. And I said, well, okay, how close are they to? Finishing such a device, he said. Well, they're they're working on it. They think it's going to happen, and they'll they'll have it ready for some kind of testing soon. I said, that's un- that's unbelievable. Um, and I said, so so tell me more about this. Is uh, uh, do they think they'll be able to send something or someone? Either it's into the future or into the past. He said, well, they think that. The only way that they can get this to work is to go into the past. And I said, well, okay. He said they haven't quite figured out the calculations or the science or the technology to go in both directions. And I said, all right. Now, next question, Gordon. Um, Who would be foolish enough to sit in something that could only be basically a one-way trip? Mm. And he said, you're looking at them. Really? Yeah, and, and at that moment, I realized, well, you know what? <clears throat> Every, probably the bravest individuals on the planet are test pilots mm-hmm. because they have to be. They have to be afraid of nothing in order to do what they do. I mean, all, all that whole right stuff that we've heard about and we saw in the book uh, and in the movie with the early astronauts, that they, they took so many chances, um, you know, to, to test all of these new vehicles, including the new stealth vehicles that, that, that we have. People of the right stuff, <clears throat> they basically are afraid of nothing. Uh, and and he was one. He was you know you have to have that kind of attitude, and, and he was one of those individuals. And I said, really, you you would take uh, and you would give up everything, your, your life here, your family, to go someplace and never be heard or seen from again. He said, well, yeah, uh, because it's all part of you know science and advancement. I said, yeah, but you're you're talking about knowing that you're not going to come back. It, it's like, you know, people now, nowadays, they talk about uh, uh, preparing for the first trip to Mars and to become mm-hmm. caught. And, and they're saying that they're actually taking, I guess, some kind of pre-applications for people who want to go to Mars, but knowing that there's no return trip. Right. I think there was like, I, I want to say hundreds of thousands of people signed up for that. I know. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't. Personally, understand the attitude, um, but but I guess that there there is a sense that you know it's not just a matter of doing something for science. Uh, I think there are people who are so unhappy with the way things are going on this planet that that they would welcome. Uh, a move <laughs> yeah. to, to go somewhere else, and, uh, that, and that's crossed my mind too. If that would, you know, if that's yeah. part of the reason. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I, so Gordon Cooper was like uh, one of those guys, and I, I'm assuming that maybe all test pilots would have would have taken uh, that kind of a trip. And mm-hmm. so here we are. That was 1980. Now we're in 2014. I'm going to assume. But I don't know for sure, so I can't prove it. I'm going to assume that a time machine has been built and has been experimented with and, and then some kind of results. But again, I don't know. No no um, documents have been released about this thing. I mean, certainly it would be a top secret kind of project. But, but wow, how, how fascinating is that? Well, you know, when I was a kid, I used to say kind of as a joke that they'll never invite, invent a time machine because otherwise we'd see people from, you know, from the future. But... Uh, but who knows? You know, I mean, uh, one of the theories of what UFOs or some UFOs could be. Yeah, that, that they could be us or humans from the future coming back in time <clears throat> with, with some, kind of a, some kind of a Star Trek non-intervention policy. It's like you can go back in time, you can, you can observe things, but do not do anything to change history. Do not step on the butterfly. Uh, yeah. 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 So well, it's all really fascinating stuff. It'd be great. It's, it's always great material for new movies and new books, and, and we all eat this stuff up that's right <laughs> yeah now i want to i want to talk about 
a, a recent interview you had. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, Rolling Stones, and yes. I, I want to say her name is Elephant. Elephant. Ele- Elephant. <laughs> yes. So I, I watched the interview, and where can someone find that? It's on YouTube, I'm sure. Actually, if if uh, if if you want to just do like a. Um it's it's on YouTube, but I think that the easiest thing to do, if anybody wants to look at it, uh, just do a Google search and just simply type in "elephant sex," <laughs> and and let me let me spell her name for for you and everybody. Uh, it's E L L I P H A N T. One more time, E L L I P H A N T. Elephant. She is a a Swedish rock star who has a variety of provocative videos out there and and several albums, and she's on a tour right now to promote these things. And a couple months ago, Rolling Stone magazine brought her into New York um, to bring her to their their UFO their UFO. <laughs> their, their, you see, you see what's on my brain. Yeah, they brought her to New York to the to the Rolling Stone studios uh, to have her interview someone about something she's interested in. And when they asked her, "What do you want to talk about?" she said, "I want to talk to someone about UFOs." So they, so it finally came to me, uh, and they invited me to come up to the studios and and be interviewed by Elephant, and um, I was happy to do it um, because I looked her up on the internet and I and I checked her out and she was she's totally totally cute. Oh yes, <laughs> and so I thought, well, how bad can this be? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I, I went there, and we we sat and we talked uh, for about, for an hour. Uh, that's how long the interview lasted, and they they condensed it down to about a three minute version, which they released uh, just a few days ago with a little story that goes with it. And basically, Elephant has been interested in UFOs. She says, like, like forever. She they quoted her as saying, "I look for a UFO every moment I get." <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. um, and and so we we talked about a variety of things, but she she was kind of interested in focusing on things like, I mean, when she asked me if I had ever had my own personal close encounter with something that I might consider as a spaceship and when i honestly said yes her her one word response was cool <laughs> don't let's not get into details <laughs> yeah i mean I, and i was fully ready to tell her about my story that i think i told you the last time yes. <laughs> but, but she went from cool to i think the next thing she said was um you, you know i really would like to become the mother of an alien hybrid baby <laughs> <laughs> and didn't you say something like Get in line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's exactly what I said. I said, well, I started laughing, and I said, you're going to have to get in line. Uh, and 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 then she would ask me, she said, she'd say, cold-blooded or hot-blooded? And I went, well, what, what do you mean? Do you think they're cold-blooded aliens or hot-blooded aliens? And I said, elephant, I, I can't possibly answer that because how would I know? I have no in, insider knowledge on this. Uh, I only really believe uh, that that we are being visited by someone, and she immediately went cool and raised both of her arms up over her head. <laughs> you know that that is an interesting question. I would have never thought to even think of that. Yeah, I, I mean, she she uh, she wanted to go in the direction of uh, do aliens um, have love in their lives, and and I said, well, it, it would be a sad thing if they didn't. But but again, I don't know. All that I know is what scientists tell me. Seth Shostak, the, the senior astronomer at the SETI Institute in California, and all that they do, what, what they do is they, they're constantly searching the heavens um, for any signs of intelligent life. And Seth told me that the current uh, thinking is that in our galaxy, our little ordinary Milky Way galaxy, um, that there might be tens of thousands of habitable planets and that there are, are very likely many planets that have intelligent civilizations on them. Uh, and, and we're only talking about 
this little galaxy that we live in because now we know that there are billions and billions of galaxies out there. So when 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 people say to me, well, you know, what proof of there you know, is there of life in the universe, I show them a picture of the Hubble telescope that was that was released earlier this year and that in one little picture shows 10,000 galaxies. I show this picture to people and I say, to me, that's proof. Mm. Look at look at that picture because each galaxy has billions of stars. Most of those stars have planets around them. So statistically, you, you can't fight the odds. There's life out there, and that's my proof. And I'm, I'm comfortable with that as proof to myself. Other people will say, well, no, that's not proof enough. Well, I don't care. Um, you know, I've, I've said to people, Martin, if you get 10 people, line them up, sit them down and and start from one end of the line to the other and ask them all what would it take for you to to believe that earth is being visited by someone hmm. you'll get 10 different answers right you, you know i mean that's just the way human nature is um and so i i am comfortable believing what i believe and i don't feel like i have to i have to defend myself and i often ha- have to i have lots of people who who write comments in my stories or send me emails and tell me that I'm full of crap, that, that I can't possibly know what I'm saying. And, and I say, I'm, I'm not an expert. I just present people. And I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to pick up a phone and call leading scientists and military people and law enforcement people and ask them what they think of this stuff. Uh, you're not just getting my opinions, you're getting my beliefs based on the conversations I have with people who we should be listening to. Um, I, you know, when, when Elephant asked me or told me that she wanted to become the, the mother of an alien baby, uh, my response to her, in, in, in addition to when I said you have to get in line, I also said that, and, and they didn't, they did not include this in the three minute version of the video. I said to her, I know people who you could talk to who could perhaps put you in touch with that situation. <laughs> But I, I, I guess the Rolling Stone editors didn't think that that was credible enough for me to say something like that. But it's but it's true. I do know people who claim that they are the fathers and daughters and wives and sons of, of aliens. And I don't know how accurate it is, but if she wants to talk to these people... I can give her some phone numbers. <laughs> yeah. Was there any other part of the conversation that they took away that um, you thought was pretty interesting? Um, just, well, for example, um, I, I started to mention <clears throat> that after I had done the uh, the album in uh, 1975 and that I believed that we are being visited, I tried to get her to ask me about the United Nations presentation that you and I just talked about, because that I, is still a very important thing that I did. But no, there, there was, she didn't really, I mean, we had the time, we could have talked about it, but she wanted to go in some other directions. And, and in fact, at the end of the interview, um, you, you, and when you see it, I, I start asking her some questions. Uh, and I asked her, what, what, pieces of her music would she like to see be transmitted into outer space Mm. and her response to that was that's a very good question well you you know and what people don't know is is that during the interview they while the cameras were still rolling they, they stopped the actual interview for a moment and the producer said to me why don't you ask elephant which which of her music she'd like to see go into outer space. So I didn't come up with that myself. They asked me to ask her that. So of course so of course she thought that that was a very good question. Well, duh. <laughs> you know. 
<laughs> and did she have an answer? <laughs> she did. She said, she said something like, I, I would like my, my new EP, um, my extra extended new video or song to, or, or album to be put out there. And I, and I, then I said something like, well, do you think that, that the, the extraterrestrials would, would get it, would understand it as music, as a form of our culture? And she said, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, 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 and it was at that point that they, the, the interview came to an end on the screen. Even, even though she, they didn't let you see where she says, I've been sitting here talking with the professor. <laughs> well, you know how those producers are. They're always thinking, you know, where they can get their plugs in. I, I know. And, 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 and you know, it, it wasn't until I got back to Huffington Post that day after doing the interview that I realized that throughout the entire hour that I was there with her, she never once actually mentioned my name <laughs> not what not not in not in the introduction her introduction was something like i'm here doing a special elephant interview and and now let's get into it and and suddenly there i was sitting on the other side of the table and the only the only way that readers or, or viewers would know that who i am was they they put you know lee spiegel huffington post underneath me on the screen uh, <laughs> it, it, because i i i, I got, when i got back to huffington post i sent an email to the producer over there and i said listen do me a favor in your post production and edit Please identify me on screen because because <laughs> Elephant never mentions my name. <laughs> that is something else. Yeah, yeah. Lee, let's uh, let's get into some of your um, stories recently because I just saw the one that you wrote the other day, and um, in New Hampshire. Yeah, uh, uh, pretty amazing. I I kind of stumbled onto this um, over the last uh, a few weeks ago. I was up in New Hampshire spending time with my family, and <clears throat> my my 15 year old nephew Benjamin uh, came up to me and just very casually, matter of factly, said, "Hey, Uncle Lee, uh, I think I saw a UFO here in in October," and um, I just thought I would tell you about it. And I said, well, well why, why did you not tell me about this before? Well, I didn't know if you'd believe it. And I didn't tell my parents because I didn't know if they would care. But you're here, so I'm just telling you about it. And I said, well, what did it look like? And he said, well, I took a picture of it. Would you like to see the picture? And he went, oh, well, y yes. Now, now we're talking. Of course I'd like to see the picture. Um, and, and he showed me um, the picture, and it's, and it's right at the top of my story um, at, on Huffington Post. It, it's, like, it's definitely a V-shape or boomerang-shaped object in the night sky. It's very well lit, and you can see, you can see the actual shape of it. And then when we zoomed in on it, um, you could almost see three separate areas on it that are, are more well defined or more or more brightly lit than the and, and lit enough where the whole object is lit up. So um, I uh, basically I if if it wasn't my nephew, I wouldn't know how reliable he was. Um, but be, but because we're related and, and you know he wouldn't he wouldn't try and pull a fast one on me. Um, I thought this was really interesting and and a neighborhood friend was with him and I talked to both of them and I ended up going outside. Uh, with Ben, and and I said, well, show me where you saw it in the sky. Let me let me ask you a few questions about it. So I did a little interview with him about it, and then I said, let's go sit at the computer. Let's see if anybody else in town may have seen the same thing, and and maybe it was reported. So he punched in. We did a Google search, and all that he wrote was Concord, New Hampshire, UFO, and we didn't even put any date on it. Um, he saw it on October fifth, but. All we did was Concord, New Hampshire UFO, and we found a couple of articles um, that talked about how other people, a family uh, in Nashua, 30 miles south of Concord, on the same night, about an hour later after Ben's sighting, they they saw this thing that came close to them above the trees, and they were driving on a highway about 50 miles an hour, and they said this thing was going maybe only 30 or 40 miles an hour, and, and, and it was really, really close, and they got a very good look at it, and it was also boomerang-shaped or V-shaped, and when they got home, uh, the, the the father Jim Jim Bo uh, quickly drew uh, made an illustration of what they had just seen 
on the way home. And then he took that illustration to his son, John, who created a computer rendition of it based on the illustration. And, and in my story, I have both the original drawing and the computer re- rendition. It's an amazing looking thing, whatever it was. And I... I took all this information, came back to to New York, and went to my editor, and I said, I think this is a good story, um, despite the fact that <clears throat> my nephew uh, is one of the prime witnesses. We, you know, we shouldn't hold that against me, uh, and, I'd, and I'd like to I'd like to write the story. And he said, do it. And so it's up there on the site right now for for all to see. Interesting sighting. And and what I like a lot about it is is that in 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 so many UFO encounters. Um, People don't have or, or don't have the time to take a picture. Um, ben is the only person who photographed this thing. Really? And, yeah, and, and when, you, when it comes to UFOs, the credibility of, of an image is, is really important to the story. And, and so that's why, that's why we went with it, because it's, it, it's a good, credible story. Now, um, what the object was... We don't know. I I interviewed uh, a guy named Mark Podell. He's with the the Mutual UFO Network, or MUFON. He's a New Hampshire field investigator for MUFON. And his his analysis, he's come back with thinking that he, he told me he studied aircraft and propulsion systems for 25 years. He thinks that what these folks all saw is a man made probably stealth aircraft that has abilities that most people aren't aware of. And I agree with him. That's that's most likely what it is um, because there's so much of that now. We know that stealth aircraft uh, have these shapes. We know that they're often tested. We know that people see them. Um, yeah, but what so, about the 30 or 40 th- miles an hour? Didn't you say that that's what they were assuming? It was. <clears throat> yeah. Um, again, when when this guy Mark said to me that uh, it may have abilities that most people aren't aware of, well, I maybe that, maybe that's one of the things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, we there are some. I, th- I think the, the Marines fly. And I forget what the what the designation number is, but there are some jets that actually can can rise off the ground right. and can, can float there for a second and then and then take off. Mm-hmm. You know, from a standing position, <clears throat> and they've been doing that for years. So. I'm not surprised that our all the money that our tax dollars pay for the black ops projects have has come up with something that can do what people claim to see in the sky. I don't have a problem with that, and and it's not necessarily extraterrestrial. When I asked my nephew Ben, I, I said, you know, what do you what do you think it was? Do you want you want to speculate what you think it was? And he he could have easily said, well, yeah, I think it was an alien from outer space, but he he didn't say that. He, all he said was, Uncle Lee, it was a UFO. It was an unidentified flying object. I didn't know what to think. It was just there. I had my my iPod. I took a picture. That, yeah, mm-hmm. That's all. And he did say that when they, he and his friend were looking at it, that this thing was slowly zigzagging back and forth in the sky from right to left, and it would rise up, and it would do it would it would do a little circle, and then it would zigzag again, and then it eventually disappeared behind some trees. Well, th- that's a good sighting. No, no matter no matter what it is, it's something unusual. And, um, and so right. it, it made for a good story, and I was I was happy that Ben could be part of the story. Excellent. So uh, we're we're out of time, basically, Lee. But uh, before I go, Alejandro wanted me to give you a hard time. Do you guys have uh, like uh, relationship issues, UFO relationship issues? Yeah, we're like an old married couple. <laughs> you know, we don't agree on anything. We give the impression that we hate each other. We're we're constantly saying bad things about each other in public, <laughs> when it, when in fact we we cannot love each other or admire or respect each other more. I I was the guy who helped him become one of the Huff, Huffington Post best bloggers about UFOs. We we talk several times a week. We just we just really admire the hell out of each other, and and I'm I'm happy to call my friend well that's great well happy thanksgiving to you and thanks so much for joining us today thank you martin it's always a pleasure to be here with you well that's it for the show today you can listen to other free podcasts on our website which is podcastufo.com 
You can also check out the links and the stories in our show notes, as well as joining in the conversation in our forums. And I want to thank everyone for helping out with the show today. Alejandro Rojas for the news and our guest, of course, Lee Spiegel, Carrie Lloyd Whitehouse for the music, Peggy Shunning for managing our Facebook page. And remember to like us on Facebook for all the latest UFO news. We have Linda Moten Howe coming up next week. And remember, you can subscribe to hear all the second half hour shows for only 99 cents a month. And we'll be right back here live next week on the Dark Matter Radio Network and every Wednesday at 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is Martin Willis reminding you to keep your eyes to the sky, and we'll see you.